folks. Thank you so much for your patience. Let's give Ted a huge round of applause for trying every cord, every wire, every computer that we have in this building. And we finally made it work. Thank you so much. So thank you all also for braving the very cold weather and filling the room tonight. This is really such an amazing crowd. Um, my name is Amali, and I'm the events director here at Books Are Magic. We are so excited to have Marie Helene Bertino and Tracy O'Neill with us tonight to celebrate the launch of Marie's newest novel, Beautyland. Um, before I get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, we will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Marie will be signing and personalizing books at the alcove next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy of Beautyland online using the link in the live stream description. Now, I'd like to formally welcome you all to tonight's event, a lecture regarding the life of an extraterrestrial based on her notes, curiosities, and transmissions. To get things started, I'm going to invite poet, editor, translator, and beyond, Ted Donson, um, to the stage. And you, you forgot to add AV technician. Um, I'm so glad we finally got this working. And I'm so sorry I just tore your office to pieces. Um, wow, this is so lovely to see everyone here. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here with you today to introduce Marie Helene Bertino and Beautyland. I've been a lucky fellow traveler with Marie's work over the last 11 years. Keenly knowing of that luck, Marie thought I might have some special insight to share with you all about Beautyland in particular. I should say that as a tender bisexual New Yorker going on 17 years in this fair city that I am thankfully used to crying in public at this point. Um, a skill that has come in handy as a lover of this book and its unforgettable protagonist, Adina. Over the course of reading Beautyland from its earliest drafts in deep winter of 2021 until its release today, I've discovered two things that will make me cry on demand. The first is the original motion picture soundtrack of E.T. <laughs> the second is this book's last five pages. This isn't a spoiler. There are plenty of cry-inducing parts of Beauty Land for reasons joyful and tragic, but there's something else that these certain tears tell me, and it might be what makes Beauty Land great, uh, truly great. Marie has an uncanny gift to imbue writing with a cumulative life-affirming sense of noticing, a generosity that permeates each sentence of Beautyland. It's been my experience in reading her work uh, during the last decade plus that uh, Marie's are not simply books to be read, but that read us as well. She writes near the middle of the book, Adina faxing to her alien hive mind light years away, Humans are inherently social, she faxes. So-called hermits who live in the wilderness are connected to other human beings by their minds. Early humans lived in groups, creating huts to gather in. The incoming fax reads, we have others reporting on that. Stick to your own life. <laughs> the fax is at once a rebuke, a relief, and most important, revelation because it introduces Adina to the most beautiful word she's ever heard, others. Many of us here, and many of us watching at home, uh, are writers. That we are is part and parcel of living in New York, why we've gravitated here. Adina Giorno finds her way here as well, following that simple one-word prompt, others. Adina's life, wrapped between these covers, is many things, but one of those is the life of a writer, which, as Beautyland would have it, seems to simply mean to pursue one's desire to communicate with others. I've heard Marie called a writer's writer. I'm not sure if she enjoys this moniker, but I do. I think this is often meant to say that she is someone whom others look to, and this is true. 
but in a more capacious, Adina-like sense, I take it to mean she is an inventor of possibility. Her writing makes more writing possible. That in this novel of alienation and finitude, it's the cosmic harmony among others of this world that breaks us open to an ever-expanding everyday universe. It's my pleasure to welcome to our humble home planet, Maria Lena Bertino. traveled a really, really long way to be here. Thank you, Ted, for that beautiful introduction. Thank you, all of you, for braving the snow and coming in the cold. This is the first snowfall in two years in New York City. What a magical day. Thank you, Amali and Books Are Magic, for hosting me. And Tracy, I am so excited to share this story of Beautyland with you. It's taken me a while to get the words right, and I want to begin by thanking those who literally made this book with me. Claudia Ballard, my agent, Jenna Johnson, Lauren Roberts, Leanna Culp, Thomas Colligan, and the whole team at FSG. Beautyland is the lifespan of a woman growing up in Philadelphia who believes she is on the earth to take notes on human beings and send them to her superiors on another planet via fax machine. And tonight, I'd like to tell you a little about the woman at the helm of this novel, about me and the process of writing Beautyland. I had a lot of stops and starts and a lot of panicked vacuuming while I figured out how to do this tonight. <laughs> Um, then I remembered that, and I tell my students this a lot, a lot of books have the entire novel in the very first paragraph. So I thought I would share with you, I'm so glad that worked, thank you, Dad, <laughs> the first paragraph of Beautyland. In the beginning, there is Adina and her Earth mother. Adina in utero listening to the advancing yeses of her mother's heart in the labor room, vitals plunging, binary stars, Adina swaying in zero gravity, and Therese fastened to the operating table. The monitor above the bed reports on their connected hearts, beating heart, heart, beating heart, beating. Therese's blood pressure plummets as Adina advances through the birth canal she has almost reached Earth. At this moment, Voyager 1 spacecraft launches in Florida, containing a phonograph record of sounds intended to explain human life to intelligent extraterrestrials. So we're introduced to a little girl named Adina in this paragraph who has just been born. It seems like in this paragraph that it's just her and her mom, but let's look at this more deeply, shall we? <laughs> In the beginning, let's stop right there. I should probably explain what happened in the beginning of time. So, <laughs> very, very quickly, 13.8 billion years ago, all the forces in the universe that did exist and would ever exist were hanging out in one super hot point. Everything began to expand because as you can imagine, usually families combust after a while hanging out together. So they s exploded and expanded and stars were formed and died and out of that all matter was formed. And everything is still expanding, like right now, all of us. We are all currently expanding. Five minutes later, cosmically speaking, a Price is Right contestant lost her top when she bounded toward the stage after Bob Barker called her name, and I was born in Northeast Philadelphia. <laughs> Thank you. There I am, working on the first draft of Beautyland. I was raised in Northeast Philadelphia, like Adina in Beautyland, and growing up, I really loved to read and write from an early age, but I didn't know any writers or how to go about being one, and we couldn't afford any schools for writing, so super long story short, I moved to New York City so I could at least be around other writers. And I found a writer's group called the Blackout Writers Group who helped me learn how to write fiction. I also learned how disparate wealth is, and this figures prominently into Adina's notes regarding class and status. 
So I would send my short stories out like it was a part-time job until I had enough published for a collection, and then I went to Brooklyn College, where I learned more about how to write a novel from genius teachers like Michael Cunningham and Susan Choi and Josh Henkin. And I see that some of my Brooklyn College peeps are here tonight. It's good to see you guys. Back to the first paragraph. <laughs> In the beginning, there is Adina and her Earth mother. Now, that line was originally just Adina and her mother. But then I went to a craft talk by the fiction writer Claire Lucchetti, who talked about the misfit detail and how sometimes one object that is slightly askew in a line can tell you a whole lot about the world. So I added the word Earth. So the reader goes, wait, what now? This is the first indication that maybe things are not what they seem. Thank you, Claire. Adina is raised by a single mom named Therese who goes through a lot of changes throughout the novel. I wanted to write a single mother that I rarely see in fiction, one who is flawed but hardworking and who changes in surprising ways. So I should probably tell you a little about my own Earth mother. Here she is. Hi, Mom. Dragging her dog and mine down the street in a wagon. For most of my life, she thought her name was Helene Therese, but one day she found her birth certificate and on it was the name Helene Teresa. Oh, she thought, I guess that's my name? <laughs> there are more than a few stories in my family about someone believing something for their whole lives and then finding a document and finding out that um, that was totally incorrect. <laughs> Do any of you know immigrant families? I feel like this is kind of common for immigrant families. Like, a lot gets lost from there to here over that big, wide ocean. Um, like Adina's mom, my mom had a near-death experience when I was born, and she also used to drag a lot of antiques out of the trash to refurbish. In Beautyland, she drags a fax machine out of the trash, and that is very important. So here we are toward the end of the paragraph, and Adina has almost reached Earth. So here's where I should probably tell you about Adina's namesakes. Adina Talvi Goodman was a dear friend to me and many people on our planet, many people in this room. She was a writer and an artist of being alive. And we lost her in 2018 at the age of 31, and I wanted to honor her by giving my protagonist her name. What feels like a million years ago, I was standing in my friend Adina's kitchen while she made a pie. Adina used to love pie day, and every pie day, you know, like P.I., and every pie day, she would invite friends over to help her bake and then eat a pie. And in her kitchen was a framed print of an apple pie, and the quote read, If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe, from Carl Sagan. And I stared at it for quite a while, and I wondered, what does that mean? In the book, <laughs> Adina's last name is Giorno, and that's after the poet John Giorno. I never got a chance to meet him, but I heard him read a million times, and he was kind of a queer Italian grandfather figure to me. In Beautyland, after Adina reaches Earth, she misses her family intensely, but she finds chosen family with childhood friends and workout instructors and little dogs and pianists with synesthesia and Carl Sagan and Yoko Ono. Sometimes the best person to notice a place is a newcomer. So she writes transmissions about things as varied as popcorn and death. But when she moves to New York in her 20s, she begins to send transmissions about this city that she learns like a language. So I figured since I'm with the New York crowd tonight, I would read a transmission about New York. <laughs> Living in New York, she writes, is like sitting at a nine million person blackjack table. <laughs> we work together against the dealer. If you call on 11, request a fresh bagel to be toasted, the whole table scowls at you. But you can trust the group. If a group of New Yorkers are walking against the light, you can cross. <laughs> if a group of New Yorkers avoid a subway car, it is covered in feces. <laughs> if a group of New Yorkers leave their cars parked on ASP day, alternate side of the street and parking meter rules have been suspended. <laughs> like it or not, you are part of the team. Uptown or down, express or local, yell, hold the train, and at least three New Yorkers will wrench their hands between the closing doors. Life in New York is a series of no-look passes. 
But let's get back to the text because it's about to get super galactic. <laughs> At this moment, Voyager 1 spacecraft launches. Voyager 1 is launched the very second Adina is born and, beco and becomes a sibling to her in the novel. Her major milestones are attached to milestones in NASA and America's understanding of extraterrestrials. Voyager 1 is famous for the golden record, maybe you've heard of this, um, that was created by Carl Sagan and his team. And Carl Sagan becomes a father figure to Adina because she believes that he is looking for her. So I did a lot of research on him and the Voyager. And here are a few of the images and greetings that are on the golden record. I don't believe I can play what I want it to play for you now. Um, <laughs> Um, that is a little audio recording of Carl Sagan's son, Nick, greeting all of the children of the universe uh, when he was age six. It's really cute. It sounds like something like, hello to all beings in the universe. It's really cute. You can look it up on Wikipedia when you go home. Um, and then this image that they decided represented something important about life. You'll see there's a woman licking an ice cream cone and a man eating a sandwich from the wrong side, <laughs> and then another man drinking water out of a pitcher oh, in a way that no human has ever drank water out of a pitcher. It, maybe this is a good time to note that drugs were a lot stronger back in the 70s. Well, you can imagine like an intelligent extraterrestrial coming across these images and thinking, yeah, I totally want to get down with that civilization. So. Um, let's return to the first paragraph for the final time. Because finally we have come to the others, the extraterrestrials. Oops. There we go. Aliens are really having a moment right now. <laughs> Scientists have found question marks in space. We've discovered the first interstellar object. And our government has just released all sorts of hidden info. Even as I wrote these lines, I was listening to a Science Friday segment on whether there is intelligent life in the universe. If aliens were to come to Earth and hide among us, they asked, where would the best place be to hide? I mean, I have an idea. How about Northeast Philly across from the auto zone? I and Beautyland wonder, however, what scientists mean by intelligent. Adina believes that on her planet, they've evolved past the body and its senses. But on Earth, here, we haven't even evolved past war or genocide. We haven't even evolved past alternate side of the street parking. <laughs> so when they say intelligent, wouldn't it mean life that's intelligent enough not to destroy its own habitat? <laughs> We've been talking a lot about stars, but I also want to mention something closer to our solar system, the moon. That is, I want to say something about home. One of the last times I hung out with my friend Adina, we went to the Brooklyn Historical Society and watched a screening of our favorite movie, Moonstruck. Moonstruck is about a family, and Beautyland is about how even when we feel far away from our people, we can still find family, but it might not look the way you think it will. Beautyland became a beautiful braiding of my sweet friend, of differentness, of family in surprising places, and it was an attempt to not only invent, but embrace the universe. So this first paragraph seems like it's only about two people, Adina and her mother, but there are a lot of unseen people here too. Like my friend and Voyager 1 and Claire Lucchetti and Carl Sagan and that Price is Right contestant <laughs> and John Giorno, but also Nicolas Cage, and everyone who helped me make the book, like Claudia, and Ted, and Tracy, and Jenna Johnson, and FSG, and everyone who helps them, and everyone who helps them. And so this paragraph actually has all of the people on Earth in it. So when we think about the eternal question that launches spaceships and books alike, are we alone? The answer is... Yes, we are alone sometimes. Sometimes in life, we feel and we are alone. 
And it would be cruel to have you listen to me this whole time and then lie to you. Because I know there are those who suffer and feel alone. And if they feel alone, they are alone. Carl Sagan said, sometimes we are just on our own. It hurts and it's lonely and it's hard. And yet, there is this giant feeling of well-being that occurs when you feel you may have found an other, someone who understands you. And writing has always been the way I have called out to the universe and said, does anyone know what I mean? <laughs> and it has been such a gift to have readers reflect back to me, yes, we also feel this way, or no. <laughs> What on God's green earth are you talking about? Or, my book arrived damaged, one star. <laughs> but in this way, we meet on the page in perpetuity, forever and ever. <laughs> Thank you, Books Are Magic, for having me. So now we're going to do a little stage change. Um, and I'm going to introduce my dear pal, Tracy O'Neill. I'm going to read her bio, and then I'm going to tell you a personal story. Um, Tracy is the author of the novels The Hopeful and Quotients, and a forthcoming memoir, Woman of Interest, which is out June 25th. Look for it. It's going to be amazing. She has been named a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree and long-listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. Currently, she teaches at Vassar College. Um, she's a genius and a rock star, a former figure skater, and four plus years ago, thank you, when I, <laughs> there we go, um, when I um, launched Parakeet on Blackout Tuesday during lockdown, um, the one day that the publishing industry decided they would not post about any books at all, that's when Parakeet came out. So I launched Parakeet into total silence. Today has been so amazing because of that silence that I remember four years ago. Except there was one person who I guess said, fuck it, I don't think racism is going to be solved on this one day. And so I am going to support my friends. And one person posted about my book that day, and that was Tracy O'Neill. And it meant the world to me. And I'm so glad she's here right now to help support me and keep me sane and calm. Tracy, can I invite you up to the stage? Can we give her a round of applause? Hi, everyone. Uh, I am so happy to be here. Um, I don't want to uh, make this like Tracy's storytelling time, but I will also share a story about Marie, which is that um, eight and a half years ago, um, I, I guess it was really more like nine years ago, I wrote an email to somebody who I didn't really know named Marie Helene Bertino. And I said, hey, I'm going to launch this book at the Center for Fiction. Will you do it with me? Um, I didn't really know any writers at the time. And Marie very, very graciously said yes, showed up in a magenta blazer um, and was as um, lovely and smart and charming and warm as she always is. Um, and we've been friends ever since. Um, so I'm so happy that we get to talk about beautiful beauty land. Um, OK. Can I? Let's do it. OK. Uh, so beauty land introduces us to an incredibly lovable character, Adina, uh, who doesn't quite feel at home on Earth. Um, and she considers herself alien. And she describes aliens this way. They are small separate and alone. They usually land in American suburbs and are found by a human uh, going through a hard time. Uh, suburban Americans enjoy dressing them in ridiculous clothing. 
At first, suburban Americans like the alien and enlist them in group activities. If the alien exhibits their own desire, the suburban Americans feel betrayed. Eventually, suburban Americans cause the alien pain. Eventually, the alien ends up alone again. Inevitably, the alien must go home. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you landed on the alien as a motivating metaphor and trope for Beautyland. How did I land on an alien? I think because I've always kind of felt bemused and alienated from certain human customs and um, habits. And I've always kind of been able to see, like, this is ridiculous when you look at it from the outside. Like, the fact that we uh, secrete water from our eyes when we're frustrated and sad and scared. Like, water just comes down our face and that signals to someone, you know, what your inner feeling is. And so I st began to keep a folder of these notes on human beings. And the folder got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, um, and then I realized there was a character glimmering through the middle of those notes. And she became Adina. Thank you. Um, and in Beautyland, Adina sends dispatches, which you mentioned um, in your presentation. And I loved those passages. Um, as I read them, I was thinking about how so often um, we're told as writers that um, analysis and interpretation are somehow not literary, emotional, artistic. Um, and yet I found myself when reading her dispatches um, about human life, um, which are quite interpretive and analytical, um, that I felt a great deal of intimacy in her gaze upon human life. And I was very moved. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk about how you approached writing these parts of the books and maybe more broadly what you think about um, the way in which we can open up that analytic scope to offer stories that do make people feel things. Oh my God, that question is so smart, Tracy. I barely understand it. Did you say, <laughs> did you say, did you say that analysis is not considered to be smart? Emotional. Emotional? Oh, em yeah. emotions are not considered to be smart? No, that, that Oh, sure. Kind of oh, yes, 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 yes. And they're very moving um, interpretations of what it means to be human, I think. So I, I hoped you could talk about those. Absolutely, yes. I mean, I think it's interesting because I think we get told a lot that so-and-so -so or this and that is not considered to be whatever. And I think one thing this book seeks to do is to redefine a lot of those opinions and viewpoints. And so, like, because I hear a lot, because this book would be considered speculative fiction. Um, I think that's, like, the going term for work like this now. But other people have called it magic realism or fabulism. And I think that many times that can be incorrectly considered to be lightweight. Um, and I feel, though, that the emotional resonance comes from exactly what you're mentioning. And I think that the the more directly and clearly we look at something, the more strange it can be, which can be really useful to our understanding, making the familiar strange. So I think that's what she's trying to do. You did great. Um, I have to ask about alien sexuality. Um, that's the whole question. Alien sexuality. Um, Adina sexuality? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, oh, thank you. Perfect. Adina, I think, is somewhere on the A spectrum, actually. Oh, that's kind of giving something away. But she is, is very much a someone who is trying to figure that out. But I consider Beautyland to be a queer book in about 15 different ways. First, the three main characters are all queer. 
um, including her. And she has three what I would consider to be coming out scenes where she tries to share what she believes is her authentic identity with three people in her life and she receives three very different reactions. And so she's forced on the outside of society because of her role as an observer, her role as a literal reporter, and because she is, she believes to be herself to be an extraterrestrial. So even that word extra, she is extra in addition to the terrain. She is not of the terrain. Um, that puts her apart and she's forced to hide her identity unless she feels she's with someone who would understand it. So she has these three coming out scenes that were very important to me um, to write. And so I think that her sexuality, her gender um, are very much, she's, she's very much trying to figure them out because on her planet, they have evolved past the body and they exist in more sound. Um, her people are this multi-souled, singular plural that um, is is more would be understood by more like in more vibrational understandings. It would seem more like sound if you were to to encounter them. So it's a hard translation for her to understand the body in in all different ways. But especially dicks. Dicks. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> poor Dina. She does have her first encounter with the, with, um, yeah, with a penis, and um, it does not go well. She's not the only one. She's not. It, yeah, this this could be a common thing when you grow up like a, a female presenting woman on the earth. Yeah. Um. So I think about this book as being very much though about friendship. Mm -hmm. Um. And so, of course, Adina has sort of her best friend in the book, Tony, mm -hmm. um, and others like Dominic. Um, but I even think in some ways her relationship with her single mother, Therese, is um, almost friendship-like, too. Um, and I love when we arrive at the moment in the text where... Adina has a realization that she, in alien speak, wants to combine, um, which um, very much has to do with connection. And so um, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about the role of friendship in the book and what you wanted to explore there. Absolutely. I think that friendship is what I'm normally writing about, and this book especially is about finding family in unconventional structures. And I think she does find that with her friends, Tony and Dominic, who she grows up with. Dominic especially is an amalgam of um, boys and men that I've known who, who love music and who I've spent so many hours listening to music and talking about music and playing in bands with. And Dominic is also kind of the indicator of time in the book too. Like, depending on what time it is, is what music he's listening to. So he, at one point, has the wallet chain, and then he goes into skinny jeans, and he's into, he has a grunge phase. And so I liked having him be a subtle indicator of what time zone we were into, because the book uh, covers an, a, a whole lifespan, and um, it's it contains decades and decades. So it was nice having him as kind of like the check-in for what time we are in. Um, so you brought up defamiliarization um, in one of your earlier responses. And one thing I was so impressed with in the book um, is that um, Adina's alienness does provide um, an opportunity um, for us to engage with things like class as social constructions and not natural. Um, and there's even a two-page dispatch about class that gets sent back to, that gets uh, sent back home. Um, and so uh, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the politics of this book. Sure. I'd love to. Um, it's funny because my friend Tom Morris wrote an introduction for Beautyland that was published in Electric Literature yesterday. 
and he's a Welsh writer, and we were talking on the phone about his intro. I was thanking him. And we were talking about writing in America, and he said, so in America, are they talking about class yet? <laughs> and I was like, no, they're not quite talking about class yet in the publishing industry. Um, and he and I come from you know lower income backgrounds, so we, we talk about that stuff a lot and how difficult it can be to get into the publishing industry when you don't have a lot of resources and you grow up under-resourced. Um, and so it was important to me to kind of make that invisible conversation visible. And man, did I make it visible in Beauty Lands. And that two-page dispatch, it's essentially like she lists, Adina lists indicators of class. And it goes from like what time you eat dinner to whether or not you're scared by noises outside to what color you get your nails painted, to if you get your nails painted. And I mean, it, it goes to a, um, a, a, a very atomic level. And at the end, her superiors are just like, we get it, <laughs> we understand. Because they've evolved past class and they've evolved past all of that. And to them, that would be the petty concerns of you know, the lowly humans on Earth. Uh, and would that we could get to that point, but um, until we do, we have transmissions like that and people who are very much trying to talk about this very thing. But you know, I also teach and I'm in academia and I find that um, it's hard sometimes to find people who understand, um, well no, that's not what I want to say. Um, what I want to say is I've had to hustle and hustling means, and I know that there are teachers in this room and adjunct professors in this room, hustling sometimes means um, working at several different schools. And, and sometimes, you know, it, it, it's, un, it's not understood how difficult that can be on someone's body and psyche. And so I remember being interviewed once for a full-time job as a teacher, and I was asked, um, well, how would you even balance your time if you were to ever receive a full-time job? At the time, I was teaching at four different schools. Um, that means four different email addresses, four different bosses, four different payrolls, uh, four different student bodies, and four different unseen understandings of how the schools work that I was supposed to effortlessly and elegantly navigate, um, which I did and was happy to do. But I explained kind of, oh, having one school to devote all of my energy and passion and love to would be amazing. And, um, and I was kind of laughed at. And I realized, oh, I'm speaking to people who don't actually understand what it means to hustle and who perhaps maybe have never had to hustle in their lives. And so, you know, I'm still hustling and I like that. And I like helping other hustlers too, but, um, you know, that's the, that's the part of the conversation that tends to stay invisible. And that's, that's what I'm trying to talk about. Thank you so much. Um, toward the end of the book, you make the observation that um, joy holds all other emotions. Um, and when I read that sentence, um, and I, I say this as a Marie Helene Bertino completist, um, I very much uh, could see the way in which I think that um, that notion or that ethos even um, has suffused your work for your entire career. I think that the work is joyful, but it does contain many different registers. Um, and so, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the way in which you have cultivated a style that can accommodate joy. That's a beautiful question, Tracy, thank you. It's hard to write about joy, and it was hard when I started out to try to figure out how I could do it. Because there's that famous quote, happiness writes white. But happiness is not quite joy. Joy is useful and helpful because it does contain pain. So there's that Bob Dylan quote, behind every beautiful thing, there's been some kind of pain. I think the way, technically, craft-wise, I've managed to do it is I've never forgotten the pain part of it. And so if you, if you tell the truth, then you have to involve, you have to include joy because 
joy exists. And I've only ever wanted to write the way life actually is as I see it. And so writing about joy was necessary. And then figuring out how to do it was the, was the hard part. And I think like balancing it with honest understandings of how tough things can be is how I've managed to like justify also writing the happy moments. And like in Beautyland, you know, I didn't want these characters to always have to struggle. So I like putting, if I can make it work, I like having moments that are there for just beauty and joy and sound and poetry. And so there's a, there's a very short scene. It turns out to be more integral and important than Adina realizes. But there's an important scene for her where she just goes to Coney Island with her friends Tony and Dominic in adulthood. And they get there in time to ride the roller coaster and they eat cotton, cotton candy and they watch this couple making out um, on the boardwalk and they, and they joke and they're talking about queering Bruce Springsteen and it's just a nice day. Um, and it turns out to be a very, very important day in her life, though she doesn't realize it at the time. And I think that having that moment of joy before, you know, the ultimate sadness is is the way I w I'm able to balance it. That's great, thank you. Um, so I don't think that this gives anything away. Um, you observe um, toward the end of the book um, that human life is quick, um, and by that you don't mean short. You make the distinction. Um, and some of the writing that I was most intrigued by in this book is the writing that um, takes on time. Because I think that so much of what we do as storytellers um, is driven by a desire to explain time and how time can ever really mean much of anything. Um, and I think at the edge of those um, that desire to explain time is also an awareness of death. Um, and I know that you have done um, training as a death doula. Um, and so I wonder if you could talk about how, if at all, um, that training informed Beautyland. Sure, it really, really did inform Beautyland. Um, and then after this, we're going to take audience questions. So begin to think about what you might want to ask. Um, it's funny that you said time is really about death, because I have some students here, and I'm forever saying, like, well, this is just about death. <laughs> it's either about death or loneliness. I'm like, this is just, it's because we're all scared to die. And this story is about death. And um, getting certified and moving through a certificate program for end of life facilitation was very much about Surprisingly, not death and sadness, but about actually enjoying the time that we have and moving through each moment of our lives with meaning and with intention. And I think that's what Beautyland is about, like being intentional and noticing what you notice, being a radical noticer, um, trying to stay present and intentional in every moment. And that is what my training has been as well. So I think that people hear that and they think, oh, that would be really sad. It's the most joyful training and it's the most um, illuminative field of study that I've ever had um, because it really is just about using the end point to live more meaningfully now. And so hopefully Beautyland has a little bit in that as well. It absolutely does. Thank you. I hope it does. Mm. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. While we wait for the first question, okay. um, I want to take note of two other brilliant books that are published today. Um, we have Sex with a Brain Injury by Annie Leontis. Perhaps you heard her interview on Fresh Air last week. She was. They were so, 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 so brilliant. Um, and City of Laughter, a debut novel out today, Tamim Fruchter. <laughs> Tamim is brilliant, and her novel's out today. Tamim, are you here? Where are you? There, there she Woo! is. Tamim, congratulations. Everybody pick up a copy. 
it's an honor to share the pub date with these brilliant, brilliant folks. Okay. Go for it. All right. So I will be fielding questions for Marie, and I already see a hand from Mr. Paul Morris. Okay, great question. So I'm going to be repeating back all of these questions for our audience on YouTube Live. Um, and so the question was, when does this book take place? And how has that impacted um, Marie's decision to use the fax machine um, as a really key material object in the book as opposed to other forms of communication? Thank you, Tracy. The book takes place, it begins, on, um, it begins in 1977, in September of 1977, when Voyager 1 is launched. Um, and then it spans for 40 plus years. And the fax machine, when her mother pulls it out of the trash, is still being used in offices. So it's like 70s, 80s. It's still an office um, machine. And then it becomes you know, obsolete throughout Adina's life though she continues to use it. That was meant to kind of point to how little we know and how we are kind of obsolete, cosmically speaking, um, <laughs> technologically speaking. Like Carl Sagan said, if intelligent extraterrestrials ever do come here, they would have to speak very slowly <laughs> for us to understand them because they are probably gonna be so advanced that um, they're far, far, far beyond us. And so the fax machine is kind of like a wink toward that as well. And also it's just like, it would be fun to just like fax. It's like fax machines are fun to put a little paper in and <laughs> I don't know, I, it's retro and I, I like that. I think we should go back to the fax machine. Okay, thank you, Paul. Who's a, who else has a question in the audience? Just okay. Um, I didn't. Are there ways in which you notice that you view the world differently or notice things differently after having written this book? Okay, great. And so the question um, was Does Marie notice that she notices things differently after having written the book? Thank you, Kelly. That's a cause and effect. I do notice things differently, and the reason I wrote the book is because I notice things differently, and then the book makes me notice things even more differently. <laughs> and when I've been asked, what do you hope readers take from this book? I <laughs> kind of want to say, I want them to view the world as strangely as I do, and I want them to notice how strange it all is, like the water and, and, and New York, and I, I want to defamiliarize them at least for a few minutes after they finish reading the book. But yeah, thanks, Kelly. Thank you for that very meta question. I think that I saw a hand from Mira Jacob. I did, but there was somebody right there. So I'll ask. Okay. Um, I remember reading a short story um, that this book blossomed from 10 years ago or something. And um, I'm curious what life and joy had to be lived between that short mm -hmm. story and this novel in order to make it. That's a great question. Um, so the question um, was, uh, there was a story that was written several years ago um, from which um, Marie drew to write Beautyland and what life and joy needed to transpire between the writing of the short story and the novel for the novel to um, get up on its legs and go. Yeah. Thank you for that question. A lot, a lot of life. Um, I, a lot of loss, you know, um, I lost my friends, um, I lost, I lost a few people and I lost a really beloved dog unexpectedly. Um, and moving through that and coming out the other end, I mean, you never get over anything, but it, it integrates into you. I will say after Adina passed away, I was strangely emboldened because I was like, 
what is the point of not doing what we're scared of? Like, what is the point of, for example, um, avoiding writing about Northeast Philadelphia, where I grew up, because I didn't think it was literary enough? Um, why? Like, what? why am I holding on to that? And what would it look like if I just said, fuck it, and tried? And I was really... Fear gave me my to-do list with this book. So, for example, writing about Northeast Philadelphia and writing about certain other topics in the book. Um, and I was really emboldened by those losses because I was like, in some ways, the worst has happened. And if I'm not at least honest and I don't move forward honoring them by telling the truth about them, then what's the point? And so that was not overnight. It took a long, long time. But ultimately, I was um, I, I, I gathered strength from those losses. But I think I can say if you read Beautyland, you'll probably see like there's a lot of life in there, a lot of living that probably had to be done to write some of those lines in good and bad ways. And I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about all of that. Fear gave me my to-do list. That's so good. I think that's just an instant classic tweet. So any of you who want to <laughs> use that, um, please. Um, I'm sure I stole that from an Instagram meme. I'm sure some lifestyle guru has said that. Well, if not, we're certainly going to make a meme of your face. Um, so uh, Mira. Okay. <laughs> so the question was pre was preceded by a comment. <laughs> We're gonna take it this one time, but uh, you know, uh, there, Mayor Jacob gets a little bit of preferential treatment. Um, and so <laughs> the comment was that um, Mira really turns to Marie when they're in the midst of um, creative work. Um, and need some grounding and that Marie has, as I'm, I think she has to many people, um, been a great source of um, surprise, consolation, help, and warmth. Um, and um, so, but the question was, um, what in the process of writing uh, surprised Marie? Is that, is that fair? Yeah, writing this book specifically. Yeah, writing this book specifically. Mm -hmm had a really great answer to this question at one point, Mira, that I completely for am forgetting now. <laughs> what surprised me? Because um, I love this question. I ask, and I ask people this question a lot. I think that um, I can think of certain lines that surprised me, because I read them now, and I'm like, when did I write that? <laughs> when did I write that? And I think that that's good. I think that means that you're in the zone if you kind of forget that. There's a section that Tracy actually um, put onto her Instagram story today about how vision and sight was invented. Um, like literally, that, sh that Adina, this is a transmission that Adina sends to her superiors about how vision came from fish and that um, skin had to kind of turn itself inside out and move toward the light to invent eyes and then invent vision. And it, they had to invent looking to look. And I remember delving deeper and deeper and deeper into the idea of eyes and vision and body parts. And that surprised me that I had the stamina and the will to keep drilling down into some of these things to get to something that surprised me. That's, and that's writer's advice. Like continue to look at something until you find something there that surprises you that you could even think of. Um, and thankfully, like there were a few times in this book 
where it really got to that. I mean, honestly, I have to hand it to grief because grief will really knock you back to your factory settings. And it can even disarm fear, like the fear of writing about certain things. And I, it definitely did for me for writing this book. And I think that the surprise is that I kept going and, um, and that I was able to try to put some of this down into words. I have to say, if I'm allowed to say like what I'm maybe a little bit proud of, is the writing about depression toward the end of the book. Um, it's hard to write about depression because it's kind of an ambient feeling. And so you have to find a way of making it specific. And so I focused here and there on what she couldn't, what she could no longer do. And um, words she could no longer say and, and things like that. And um, I'm glad I have that there. I hope it helps people. I hope it helps people who have depression. I hope um, there's domestic violence in the book. I hope it helps people who have been through that. Um, and I'm, I, I think the surprise is that I kept going. And um, I was only able to do that because of the people in my life, the people I've already mentioned, and um, friends who are writers um, who allow me to continue to attend writer's church with them, they make the difference. Um, if you have a writer in your life, um, offer to read their work and then encourage them and support them no matter what. It makes the difference and sometimes it's the difference between life and death for some people. So um, yeah, keep writing, keep going, that's all you can do. Thanks for that question. Okay, thank you so much, Marie. That was wonderful, and I'm so excited for this group to get to experience Beautyland themselves. Marie will be signing books, I've heard, um, so I would highly encourage people to, um, you know, go purchase a book, get in line, and uh, keep it brief because Marie also needs a drink. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all again so much for coming out, bearing with all of the many moving parts to tonight's event. Um, thank you again to Ted for being so dedicated. I'm so glad it all worked out. And um, of course, thank you to Tracy for moderating tonight's discussion, asking thank all the best Tracy. questions. And thank you to Marie for launching this very, very special book with us. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Tracy. So just a few quick reminders before we wrap up. If you're still with us on the YouTube live stream, you can purchase a copy of Beautyland by clicking the link in the, live in the live stream description. If you also tuned in a little bit late and missed part of the presentation, the link to all of those texts and images is right below that one as well. So feel free to check that out. For those of you with us here tonight, if you haven't gotten a copy yet, we have a few, I believe, left up at the front that you can purchase if you already got one. Now's your chance to get another. We also have copies of Marie's novel, Parakeet, um, as well as Tracy's book, Quotient. So I highly recommend checking those out as well. Marie will be signing. That's going to be happening at the little alcove where my coworkers, Bex and Tiffany, are pointing to right now. It'll all make sense a little bit in a moment. We just ask that you please grab all of your personal belongings with you so that we can start breaking down the chairs, line up down the center aisle, and curve around to the, to the wall. Please hold your hugs and kisses and affections until you reach Marie in the line, just so we can get things moving. Okay, that's all. Let's give these two one last round of applause. Yeah.